Hello, my name is Christine Zorowski. I'm the sexual health clinician with the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. And today I'm actually going to talk to you about optimizing your sexual adaptation after prostate cancer treatment. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the different funders and supporters that we have for the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. Funding for this initiative initially came from the Specialist Service Committee back in January 2013. And in March 2017, through the BC Ministry of Health, we actually got additional funding for a provincial expansion. I also want to acknowledge the different private donations that we received from different groups and patients, because without the donations, without the funding, we would not have the Prostate Cancer Support Care Program, and we would not be here to support you. So when I think about the sexual changes associated with prostate cancer treatment, all prostate cancer treatments can cause sexual changes. The type of treatment that you will have will determine the timing of these changes. For instance, with prostatectomy, the sexual changes are pretty much immediately right after surgery. When we think about brachytherapy, in the acute phase of treatment, there can be sexual changes that slowly recover, and then as time progresses and the radiation takes more effect in the prostate gland, then you'll see more sexual changes occurring. With external beam radiation, again, we see the sexual changes actually occurring over time. And with androgen deprivation therapy, what we see is as the testosterone begins to decrease, that's when you're going to see sexual changes. So what are some of the changes you might experience? Well, when we think about erections, there could be erections that are a little bit weaker, they may be hard to maintain, or they might be completely absent. When we think about ejaculation, there could be decreased volumes of ejaculation or the ejaculatory fluid, or there not, might not be any type of ejaculation occurring at all. Sometimes with brachytherapy is in the initial phases when a man begins to um, ejaculate, there might be a little bit of blood that's noticed in the ejaculatory fluid. When we think about orgasms, orgasms, they might pretty much stay the same, or there might be some discomfort or pain experienced. Uh, the intensity of the orgasm might be decreased, or there might be an increase in intensity. About 20% of men actually say that their orgasms are better. In fact, some of them have learned the secrets of women and they've become multi-orgasmic. When we think about genital, genital sensation, most of the time men say that there's not a lot of change that can occur to the genital sensation, but sometimes they find that there might be decrease in the sensation, or there might be painful or sensitive. Sometimes I hear the term hypersensitivity, and usually that actually decreases over time. With continence, there can be the leakage of urine during sexual arousal, or there also could be leakage of urine at the time of orgasm, and this is actually known as climacteria. With sexual drive, we see because of some of the changes a man might be experiencing, there could be a decrease in sexual drive, or a man who's on androgen deprivation therapy, ADT, there might not be any type of sexual drive. In fact, they might be what I call sexual neutral. And then, of course, with sexual self-view, be uh, altered again as a consequence of all the different types of sexual changes occurring. When we think about sexual adaptation, the sexual changes for prostate cancer treatment can impact sexual self-view, including body image and masculinity. This can lead to a potential loss of sexual self-confidence and disrupt sexual intimacy for individuals and couples. The sexual consequences of prostate cancer can interfere with your sexual pattern, but it can also create opportunities uh, to explore other ways of being sexual. Individuals who have been in a partner relationship for a long period of time usually develop a pattern of being sexual. You know, there's nothing wrong with having a pattern. Like, why change something that's familiar, that's comfortable, and allows the appreciation of sexual pleasure? The experience of prostate cancer causes changes in how you may be sexual with yourself or your partner. And this creates the opportunity to explore other ways of being sexual, ways that you might not have considered before because you had a pattern. So when we think about the sexual adaptation, it is a process that helps individuals move forward discovering new ways of being sexual, along with redefining one's sexual self-view and corresponding sexual values. In my practice, I find that there's four different principles that have been really helpful as individuals or couples navigate the sexual adaptation process. Those principles are acceptance, flexibility, patience, and persistence. With acceptance, we see recognizing and grieving what is lost. With flexibility, it's important to be open-minded. 
you know, it's important that you explore your sexual values and determine whether or not these are going to hinder or foster sexual explorations. For example, how would you feel about sexual toys? Is it something that you uh, feel that this can be something as part of your sexual life, or do you have some negative attitudes about sexual toys? Do you feel that they might be a replacement or that you shouldn't need them? If you have these types of feelings, then what happens is that it might limit your opportunity to see how they can actually enhance your sexual repertoire. So what's important is that sometimes we need to explore where these values or beliefs are coming from before we actually can make an adjustment. The next two processes or principles are patience and per, per, uh, persistence. With patience, we know that this is a valuable life skill, especially when we're learning something new. And with persistence, the success and adaptation process takes time to develop, and you will go through trials and errors. When we think about sexual adaptation, there's two components. There's penile rehabilitation and there's sexual rehabilitation. Sometimes a person might decide to focus on one or both of these areas. When we think about penile rehabilitation, it actually consists of actions to help keep the rectal tissue healthy in the penis during the recovery period. As with our bodies, if we don't exercise the penis on a regular basis, the tissue will begin to actually shrink or atrophy, and the ability to create and maintain erections might decline. Our recommendation is that a man should try to create at least three erections per week bringing blood into the penis either during sexual play with a partner or self-stimulation. A lot of men might actually do um, penile massage in the shower in the morning, right? With a little bit of soap, a little bit of water, actually help to facilitate that blood flow. Other options include using erectile aids to stimulate the blood flow and or create erections. Such aids are things like the pills, PD-5 inhibitors, things like Cialis, Levitra, Staxin, or Viagra. Um, there's also intraurethral suppositories known as MUSE or intracavernosal injections. Also, there's vacuum erection devices. All these are helpful for penile rehabilitation or also creating erections for sexual play. When we think about sexual rehabilitation, there's different types of elements that are going to help you in this area. First off, gaining knowledge about sexual function. You know, understanding how that prostate cancer treatment has affected you, what are your sexual consequences. Sometimes understanding why they're occurring makes them easier to kind of cope with. And also the other thing that's really important is developing good communication skills. You know, with coping, we have actually uh, different types of counselors available to help support you, to help you navigate some of the emotions that you might be experiencing. Or you might be coping with your, with your partner. The other thing about communication skills is that, you know, a lot of times many people um, don't really talk about sexual issues, right? When there are changes of how your body might work sexually, conversations are not only helpful, but they're essential. The more you talk, the easier it becomes, right? Also, communication is helpful with understanding how those sexual consequences are impacting you and what you can do to move forward. Even when starting a new relationship, open, Honest communication is important as you, as you develop an understanding and work at designing a sexual life together. Refocus intimacy with your partner. You know, there's lots of different dimensions of intimacy that, that individuals or couples might have in their relationship. You know, some of the basic ones that we come across are intellectual intimacy, which is kind of like the sharing of values and ideas. And then what you have is actually um, experimental intimacy, which is actually doing different activities together with your partner. There's emotional intimacy, how you support each other, and of course there's sexual intimacy as well. There may be a shift as to what type of intimacy is important for you right now. And what I find as individuals kind of go through the sexual adaptation process, the different types of intimacies might become, again, more relevant. So understanding societal myths that influence personal values. You know what? We get a lot of messages from our society, and I call, which I actually call myths, because they can influence sexual beliefs, values, and your behaviors. Some examples of a sex, um, societal myths are things like sex should be spontaneous, with no planning, no talking, or sex means intercourse, or men should initiate sexual activity, or sex is for the young people, right? So it's really important to understand where your values and beliefs are coming from. Because again, if they're part of coming from societal myths, you might have to make some adjustments with that. Right? 
So again, making those adjustments will help support a positive sexual self-view. That's going to create better sexual confidence, a more healthier body image, and also a healthier sense of masculinity. And of course, discovering new ways of supporting desired sexual activities and our behaviors. So the thing with that is like looking at, you know, different ways of, you know, being sexual, whether it's self or partnered masturbation, uh, oral stimulation, erotic sensual massage, or even kind of looking at tantric lovemaking. For some individuals, they might do exploration with sexual toys and aids, such as lubricants, vibrators, dildos. So key thing to remember is that the sexual adaptation process can take years that you are still a sexual person even with the changes to sexual function and that your sexual life is your own and it is you and if you have a partner who should decide what is important and comfortable. You are the best gift that you can give somebody. And remember, the team members at the Prostate Cancer Support Care Program are here to support you and help you with that sexual adaptation process. Thank you. <laughs>